Is it working now? Okay, so I propose that we start this session. Uh, and again, I apologize if we are a little late. Um, what I would propose is that all of the presenters make presentations on, on this subject and then we have a general discussion. And because the previous panel, I will blame it on them still, um, the previous panel is running a little bit late, we'd still like to finish uh, around about 12.45 about 12 if we can, if that's okay with everybody, to be realistic. And we've got a very distinguished panel here today. Um, I would propose that I would just introduce people by name without going into the biographical details. But um, just to give you an idea of who is actually on this panel, we have um, Chris Corbin. I want to introduce myself first. I'm Graham Vickery from the OECD. I'll make a small presentation, very short, to set the scene for this. And then um, I will um, hand the proceedings over to the panel. So our panelists are on my extreme left. So on your extreme right, in fact, we have Chris Corbin from the United Kingdom, but he has been basically managing the system of implementing the e European Commission directive on pu public sector information. So he knows all about the whole 27 countries who are in the process of looking at public sector information and trying to make it freer, more accessible and used more widely. And he will tell us a lot about how to deal with that in a very complicated political situ policy situation in the United Kingdom. Then we have Rajiv Chawla, who's on my extreme right, or on your extreme left, um, who is the uh, Commissioner for the Survey, Settlement and Land Records Department in uh, Connecticut. Kanataka, if I pronounced that correctly, um, which is the state alongside um, Andhra Pradesh. And he's going to talk about the work that they've been doing in, in digitizing and making available land records, which I think is a very, very interesting story um, in India. Uh, then we will have uh, Ilka um, Likanen from Nokia, sorry, Siemens, Nokia Siemens Networks, Nokia, Nokia Siemens Networks, and who will tell us a little bit about the Finnish story and also trying to tell us a little bit about the perspective from a company trying to um, make uh, a business case out of using um, public sector information. And then we'll turn over to, to um, Dr. Govind, from um, the, who's on my right and uh, just to your, your left. Um, who is, comes from the Ministry of Communications and Information Technology to give an overview of the developments in India. So I would propose that I would just um, go to the, the podium and I'll just tell you briefly about the OECD um, recommendation on public sector information. You should all have a little booklet um, available. If you don't have one available for you, there's a, a, some of them on the side. Um, table over there. So I'll just tell you a little, a little bit briefly about what we're trying to do. And it's really a global attempt to try and improve access to public sector information. So I'll just um, run through my slides very briefly to set the stage and then I'll tur turn over to Chris and then um, to Rajiv and then we go to the order that I mentioned. Thank you. <coughs> This is also an, an exercise to see if all the technology works here. So that's why I'm going to move around and use everything. I also must say that I'm supplying our own laptop here, so that was interesting. I arrived, there was no laptop, so we're doing this, this is a do-it-yourself exercise. Um, so the background to this session is that at OECD we've been thinking about um, what the future of the digital economy should be, but more importantly, trying to think about where different areas of the economy where there's large amounts of information which is either underutilized or could be utilized better, or where there's very complicated um, regulations and arrangements for getting access to digital information. And one of the obvious areas, of course, is the public sector. And when we talk about the public sector, we're interested in um, public sector information which covers uh, not only such things as weather information, 
which is a huge, of huge interest to everybody, um, particularly in large dis dispersed countries such as India, but also all over Europe. I'm Australian by nationality. Everybody in Australia is obsessed by the weather, particularly seeing as because it has not rained for the last five years, approximately. Um, and then there's other, other areas such as maps and cartographic information. And we think when we're talking about public sector information, we're going all the way through to museums, cultural information, which is somewhat different. But we would say that the same principles of access and information supply to, to those as well. So we'd say the whole um, gamut of activities which are in the public sector, which are nominally public goods, but often are not. So that, that is what we're trying to think about, ways of improving access to that information. So we worked on this at OECD for about 18 months or so, and we produced what we call a recommendation of the council. It's not a law for OECD countries, but it's, it's guidance and it's quite high level, and, and we um, expect countries to adhere to this recommendation when thinking about public sector information. So basically, just very, very simply, I've got three slides only, because I'd like to hear much more from the panel than from myself, and our, our information is in the, the small blue covered booklet, which I mentioned previously. What we're trying to do is improve access um, and use of public sector information for both use in other parts of the public sector and in the private sectors as well. And their idea is a, is a very simple one. If governments are going to invest a lot in, for example, um, producing land records, producing meteorological information, producing all sorts of information, then we can think of improving the total returns by improving access and encouraging use. This is not only for economic returns, but also social benefits. You get more, more efficient distribution, potentially, um, enhanced innovation in terms of thinking about technologies which can um, be used and can be developed to use public sector information. New uses, for example, try to link, um, say, weather information with locational information, those sorts of things. And we're also thinking about um, trying to imp imp increase market-based competition in these areas because in most areas in the past governments have not only produced information but they've monopolized it in the, ten in the sense they have tend to want to distribute themselves or have some sort of monopoly distributor so we would say that there are other market-based ways of actually improving um, access and use. So um, our starting point is that we believe that openness is the basic principle that um, if governments do have information, the information should be made widely available, um, it should be open in the sense of people should know what are in the, in the, um, the uh, um, lists and, and in the archives of government to the maximum extent possible, and that this um, general principles of openness and reuse apply to all categories of information and content. And of course, there are some restrictions. I mean, there are such things as intellectual property rights, as we know, which can be on some sorts of information, particularly in museums or archives, for example. There are such things as we have to worry about privacy, confidentiality, national security concerns. In some areas, obviously, for national security reasons, governments cannot give information away um, easily. And also, um, areas such as democracy, human rights, freedom of information, they are all issues which need to be taken into account if you're going to free up government information. So this is not, this is also needs to take into account all those sorts of areas, but we're talking about different sets of information which should be readily available. And I keep on coming back to the weather information, mapping information, museums and archives, etc. And the, the, the other framework, if you like, condition is we're trying to strengthen the role of the non-public non sector in terms of using this information, but in a competitive way. In the past, again, a lot of governments gave their information, if they did give it to another body, they gave it to a monopoly provider. So you went from a, a monopoly um, creator of information to one monopoly provider. So we would say it is much better to have competition in the same way you have competition for mobile phones or whatever. You should think about if you, if you are going to distribute information, then distribute it through multiple sources. You don't have, have monopoly distributors. So our principles, 
We have 13 principles. 13 might be an unlucky number. We tried to make it 14 or 12. We ended up with 13. So one of the aims of this meeting, of course, is to see if we're missing something. When we re revise these recommendations in three years' time, we can add a 14th or maybe get rid of one and we end up with 12. So the um, booklet which you have outlines these in more detail, but I just mention them very simply. The principles are based on the idea of openness, that there should be much easier access to government information unless there are good reasons not to make it available, based on a general openness principle, that public information should be open and should be usable. Um, and the access should be transparently available. That means you need to have lists and whatever so that people know what's available and people know potentially how to use it. That I now sort of cover the next point, which is asset lists, which means that if governments are producing all sorts of information, which they are, probably about one third of the information which is available, then you need to have asset lists. It needs to be quite clear and these should go across different <coughs> government departments. There's problems of quality, of course. How do you control quality, particularly for the dis um, distribution end? A lot of issues there. Integrity, you have to make sure the information is not changed or manipulated by some of the users. Um, new technologies, um, obviously technologies are changing. A lot of the public information is available only in, if you like, paper form or in some inac inaccessible forms. So you have to think about not only new technologies to digitise things, but also um, long-term preservation, because there are some interesting stories about, for example, census records in some countries, which are put onto tapes which are run by old, if you like now, old IBM computers. When you can find the IBM mainframe which can deal with the census information, all of your magnetic tapes are deteriorated. So that, and this is a real story, I will not say what country, but this is a real story from an OECD country. And so that you have to make sure you can have long-term access as well, and you have to worry about interoperability. Copyright I mentioned. Um, we argue that copyright should be waived to the extent possible, that copyright, as far as government information is concerned, if everybody agrees, then copyright should be waived, and obviously users, reusers should not and then have copyright on this information to the extent possible. Pricing issues, we would also argue that um, public sector information to the extent possible should be available free of charge or should be available at marginal cost of distribution. That creates problems to, about how you finance the actual creation of this information, but that is a separate issue. Competition I mentioned, um, this has to be distributed in a competitive way. Redress mechanisms, if people are going to complain about to the government, then it has to be quite clear how they can complain. A lot of this can be done with public-private partnerships. International issues, again, very important. Some meteorological information, um, for example, I will not make in, in Europe, actually, uh, some countries do not distribute the meteorological information or do, do not allow um, access from international users and again this is very important. If you're going to have information which could be potentially used widely you have to make sure that um, at least other users and uh, potentially international users can have access to it. And finally one of the purposes of this meeting is to think about how we can um, spread around best practice much better. So how do we actually know that one country, one state, one area, one museum, for example, is doing much better than others in terms of distributing information? So again, we would argue that we, OECD, you, the people in this room, all of us should think about what works, what doesn't work, you know, what businesses are doing, what business associations can do in terms of saying, well, this is how we've used this sort of public sector information and this is how we think we should use it so that everybody benefits, the governments, the users, the wider community. So thank you. I will now um, turn over to my next speaker, Chris Corbin, who's going to tell us about the trials and tribulation of what's been happening in Europe before we go to uh, Mr Chawler, who's going to tell us about some of the Indian experience.
Uh, well, <coughs> excuse me. Well, Graham is just uh, loading the presentation. My name is Chris Corbyn, and as Graham said, I'm from the UK, but I'm here actually representing um, a European-funded project um, called EPSI Plus. And the task of this European-funded project is to monitor Europe as a whole uh, as to how it is implementing the law uh, related to the reuse of public sector information. So this is slightly different to what you've just heard from the OECD. The OECD is guidance, it's principles for you to adopt, hopefully, and abide by. What I'm relating to you about is within the European area is a law which member states within Europe have to, in fact, enact and apply. But before I can actually talk about the, the law, um, I need to just um, briefly talk about the um, European Union itself. The European uh, Union uh, is a group of countries which work together under a, a common treaty um, to form a single market, um, and the single market means freedom of movement of people. Um, there are 27 member countries at the moment, there are countries waiting to join um, and some waiting to apply and the European free trade area also um, has abides by the European Union laws. So what we're talking about is a number of countries in excess of 32 to 33. Um, those countries are multicultural, they're multilingual, so in the European Union there are 23 national languages, so every law has to be presented in those languages. Uh, that takes time and of course you then have various issues with regards to translation and so on. These countries are all at different stages of development. The GDPs are very broad. They're all of different, different governmental structures, so some are federal, some are central. Um, uh, some are quite new in uh, that they've moved from being under a centralised um, command type economy into a market economy. So they have, ha uh, have an opportunity to in fact leapfrog over a number of uh, the older European member states. Now Europe itself has been involved in trying to move forward the reuse of public sector information for over 20 years. Back in the 1980s, around about 1987, the European Union actually agreed a set of principles very similar to what you saw from the OECD just now. And those were guidance. They were best practice for people, uh, countries to implement. Uh, 15 or 18 years went by, nothing happened, so then the European Union created a law to try and move this along to exploit the value or the latent potential which lies within that public sector information. And in 2003 they agreed a law uh, which entered onto the European statute book um, on the end of 2003. Member states have 18 months to implement it um, and then it's reviewed three years later. So we're at now in 2008 and we're reviewing that um, law itself. Now public sector information in the European Union is um, bound by a whole series of laws related to privacy, uh, IPR, data sharing um, and all these things which are all the, uh, sitting there in that yellow box below and then below that is the treaty of the, of the European Union which says how in fact you should uh, uh, operate and some of the, uh, the articles of that treaty says uh, deals with monopolies and cross subsidisation. The European Union itself has been monitoring um, the um, progress of the, these laws for now over eight years and uh, they're committed to do it so for 2011. And the only reason I'm mentioning that is what I'm about to say is actually the findings and the constant monitoring um, of that information um, itself. And all of this information is collected or collated and put onto this website. So if you actually want to look at what goes on in Europe together with other parts of the world, because Europe um, monitors other parts of the world to see how Europe is getting on, whether there are in fact is a common element right across the world, um, as well as of course other parts of the world contributing to um, the overall debate. So what has actually been learnt over the um, or over this period of uh, implementing the law. Well, the good news is that um, within Europe, being Union, all the member states have now uh, implemented the law. Now, when I say implemented the law, that doesn't mean they've done it to the letter of the law, but under the European Union uh, Treaty, they have to transpose the European law 
into a country law, and all of them have done that. And the, um, those who have not quite done it correctly, the European uh, Commission uh, takes them to the European Court and uh, they are then have to put um, the, their law right. And for example, at the moment, there is two uh, cases of what we call infringement going on. One relates to Sweden and one relates to Poland. Now, the evidence which comes out of all this implementation shows that what is needed, uh, above all, it, within a country, is leadership. Uh, you also need to be very simple. It, it's, it has to be... Uh, simplicity is key. And the reason you need simplicity um, uh, here is that you're dealing with a large number of public sector bodies. In Europe itself, there's well over a million of them. Within that million bodies, there is nearly 50 million public sector employees. So the task is how do you manage to raise the awareness and ensure all those public sector bodies uh, comply? Well, one of the uh, recommended ways of doing this, and it's becoming very, very clear now, is you need to move towards simplistic ways of doing things. Graham mentioned that there must be openness. You must be open at all times and you must be transparent and furthermore the public sector bodies must be accountable. Now what is this PSI law about? It's about the reuse of the public sector information for other purposes by anybody else in the society whether it's for profit or not for profit. So that's the first thing. And the, the law is a minimum economic framework to stimulate uh, innovation and the economy through reusing this public sector information. By doing that, you need to uh, provide the reuser with some form of what we call risk containment. They need to be able to know that if they're going to deal with this giant called the government, who Graham has described as a de facto monopoly, which they are in many cases, then you need to know uh, how you can actually deal with them. So the public sector information laws tend to look like they're about the public sector, but really they're about trying to release that information for others um, to use. So um, the, Econ the European Commission um, did a, carried out an economic study just at the point the law was implemented in uh, the countries in uh, uh, July uh, 2005 and it has just completed another one um, which is just published in the last week or so. And that actually shows that after all this time, five years, uh, there's two things which are still blocking the reuse of it, public sector information. The first one is the charges, or prices as Graham uh, related um, in his slide. The charges are far too high and the conditions that are related to the charges through the licenses are too onerous and so people don't reuse the information. The European Union, it's, uh, commi sorry, the European Commission itself then actually undertook a consultation this year to try and find out, well, what does uh, all the stakeholders think has actually happened? And they've recently published the, uh, the findings of that um, consultation together with all the submissions, and from that they're saying it, the indicators are that there are still technical measures to be done. So, for example, if you actually want to have an asset list a metadata service, uh, what standards do you use, how do you actually implement that, that sort of thing. There are still need for legal measures to be um, undertaken, so for example the European uh, law allows public sector bodies to opt out, so there's the view that you, no public sector body should be allowed to opt out. There is implementation and organisational issues, so for example there needs to be a regulator. There's no good having a law if nobody's aware of it, either in the public sector or anywhere else in society, uh, and there's no regulator that once they, people start to use it and it doesn't quite work to ensure things are working correctly. There needs to be accountability, so there needs to be monitoring, and there needs to be guidance. So here it's quite interesting, the European Union started with guidance, went to a law, and now has come back to guidance. So this word, what are the, um, some of the interesting aspects of this? Now the first word thing is, which is quite interesting, is this word public sector. What is public sector? One has a feeling that, well, maybe it's one uh, thing, one entity, it's homogeneous, but in fact, of course, it's not. 
government's public sector is structured for democratic reasons through uh, central level, uh, regional, state level um, and also local level. So what you actually have is various levels within the public sector, all of them have elected politicians and therefore you immediately have dif different domains within the public sector um, area itself. Then below that, of course, there are, there's the health sector, there's the law and order sector, there's a whole series of sectors which are still public sector, but they're not part of the, those other areas, and they all have their own IPR relationships, ways of doing things. So does this matter? Well, of course, it does matter to a certain extent if um, you wanted to um, deal with intellectual property right. Who actually owns the intellectual property right in the public sector? Um, which part of the public sector has it. Um, it matters if the public sector operates on the o open market. And there's some now very clear uh, guidance coming, um, or very clear ways of doing things. The first thing is that there needs to be leadership. You need, if you're going to implement this in a country, you need to appoint somebody, uh, a body, within the country uh, in the government to take this law forward, raise the awareness and, and so on. There needs to be, when you implement this legislation, a clear differentiation between the freedom of access or the access law and the reuse law. The reuse law is based on the access law. If the access is permitted, and in Europe, if the reuse is permitted, then these are the conditions that apply. So you need to keep a clear separation. And this is quite uh, important in the countries which have a written constitution, where the, in the written constitution they embed the right to access of information. If you start to merge the two, you're starting to change the constitution, and that gets rather complex. So keep them separate. The next area, just to touch on briefly, is that of charges. Um, how do you uh, implement the charges? Now, the preferred method, of doing this um, is actually to not to charge at all if it's cost effective to do so or at the, at the, uh, the worst case you only ever charge the, the uh, cost to the public body of providing the information. You do not charge for, try to charge for the task, the public task that the body has done. So a clear message is going, uh, coming out of this to others who wish to implement it. Do not reuse the reuse context as a means of uh, financing your public task. The public task has to be done in the public interest using uh, the, pub the government's funds. Uh, the licensing needs to be easy and quick. So click use licenses or something like Creative Commons. Exclusive arrangements need to be phased out. Now, if you're implementing it, there may be exclusive arrangements already in place, and you need to give people time to phase those out. In the European context, they, all countries were given five years, and that five years ends at the end of this year, at the end of December, after which the European Union can take any member state uh, of the European Union to court, the European Court for not phasing out uh, exclusive arrangements. Now, exclusive arrangements pop up quite a lot in um, contexts of digitization, in other words, trying to put on um, archival information, uh, trying to uh, tackle, say, some e-government initiative. Uh, so one has to look at all across a very broad spectrum and one of the things which is very clear from Europe is that the centre of government does not know, has no idea, how many public sector bodies have exclusive uh, agreements embedded uh, uh, in practice within um, themselves. And then the last thing I've, I just briefly uh, talk on so that we can move on is that you need to have a clear redress mechanism. And by that, when things go wrong, by the read from the reuser's perspective, they have a way of actually um, going to somebody, that being looked at, and then being put uh, straight or corrected um, if it's uh, need to be corrected uh, in a a time which is pertinent to the reuser, not the public sector body. 
So again, this has been is missing in many of the member states of Europe. They've decided well, what we'll do. We, we have an ombudsman or an ombudswoman um, or some other sort of public administrative complaint procedure. We use that. That clearly misses the point. You really need to have a very dedicated service to actually deal uh, with these issues. Uh, maybe with many more of the issues related to Europe we could actually pick up in discussion. Thanks very much, Chris. As I said before, I, I propose that we have all the presentations and then we have discussion afterwards, if, if that's okay. But if anybody has one burning question now, um, please provide it. Um, I cannot see anybody raising their hands. So after each um, uh, intervention, I'll see if anybody has a burning question. Ah, we do have a burning question. countries, why don't you think of uh, entrepreneurship as one of the principles because a lot of information is available in the, in the public sector domain, a lot of information need to be shared across, but the huge population mass is there, especially in the Asia uh, region and more in the developing countries. So if this is built in with some kind of entrepreneurship models which can be there to provide the information at a cost, very nominal cost, but the idea there is to engage themselves into, into the whole system which will definitely uh, give uh, uh, strength to the penetration of internet and broadband, that's number one. Number two, they also become a part of the economic systems. So that's what uh, I had just uh, thought of. Thank you very much. That's entrepreneurship and empowerment at the same time. So maybe we've got now up to 15. <laughs> Thank you very much. But it's worth considering because I really would like to actually think about how practical these, the, these principles are. So if there are no other comments or questions immediately, I propose we now turn to Dr. Chawla, um, who um, will make a, a, a short presentation. And the inter very interesting story about um, the digitization and the increasing the availability of land records in um, the state of, I hope that I pronounced this correctly, uh, Connecticut. Um, so that uh, the, uh, I happen to come from, while we're setting up the, the system there, I've got a particular interest in this. I come from a part of Australia where, in fact, they invented something called the Torrens title, um, which was a Mr. Torrens who invented this, because simply because there was no clear way of working out who owned what um, and how, how you're going to pass on, very simply, um, your land to somebody else. If you sold it, somebody you, you died and you, somebody else inherited, for example. And this is a, a perfectly, wonderfully simple sort of system, which slowly, very slowly, has been adopted elsewhere in Australia. Um, but it took a long time because everybody has their own systems. And I think that actually transparency and um, transferability of land records and land you know, ownership records is really vital um, for any um, state or any region. Thank you. So Mr. Chol is almost ready to go. About uh, 500 kilometers away from this place, the capital of Karnataka called Bangalore. I, I would talk for about next five to 10 minutes about a project called Bhumi. Uh, Bhumi means land in colloquial language. Karnataka has computerized the land records and put them in the public domain. And that is something which, which is very popular in that place. Uh, in Karnataka, and that's, the, that's true for a country like India, land records are extremely critical. They actually form the backbone of the agrarian economy. They are virtually used for every purpose. You want to take bank loan, you want to sell land, you want to purchase land, you want to take scholarship for your child, you want to admit your child in the school. It's virtually your identity card in the rural areas. There are 7 million farmers in Karnataka and there are about 20 million records, 20 million parcels of land and therefore those many records. The parcels are increasing day by day because fragmentation is taking place, the population is increasing. These records which were in 30,000 villages, which is the number of villages in Karnataka, used to be managed by 10,000 village officials for last 150 years. The records were susceptible to problems. It opaque system because the village officials used to maintain records in the manual form. 
Uh, it was very cumbersome for the citizens to approach village officials and take copies of the record. Integrity of data was always doubtful because, this, because the records were prone to manipulation and that gave village officials tremendous power in this country. They were the king makers, they, had, they have absolutely all powers to fiddle with the record the they, way they wanted to and the farmers were always, always uh, worried about the security of their tenure. Every record in Karnataka has about 50 fields and therefore the total size of the database in the manual form was 1 billion data field. What was exciting about this project was therefore the size of the data which was to be digitized from the manual format to a computerized format. The size is what was gigantic. What was done? The project was implemented between the year 1999 and 2003 and as on today these land records have been digitized. In the first phase they were put in 200 government centers and then later put on the web. As on today these 20 million records are on the web. There are 1000 public private participation centers which are now distributing these records across 30,000 villages and 4000 new tele centers are coming up very fast which will make about 5000 centers across Karnataka making land records available to citizens on demand. Uh, it's a highly self-sustainable project. The fact whether public sector information actually requires funding is, is something which needs to be itself looked into and found whether there can be in interesting business models where in spite of the fact that you are putting huge data in public sector domain, do you really require funding or are citizens ready to pay small user charges and a clever business model therefore reduces the dependence from the government. 1000 million rupees is what is there in the Bhumi user charges fund as against 18 million rupees, 180 million rupees which were spent on this project. 1000 million rupees is what is saved in last 8 years after the recurring expenditure uh, which, is, which is every year about 70 to 80 million rupees on the project. <coughs> what are the benefits which have been achieved? The land records are in public domain, they are available to everybody. Uh, any one of you uh, can go to the website and see the records. They obviously no more tampering is not possible, the records are now very safe, digitally signed records. There is an easily updatable mechanism. That means if somebody is selling the land or purchasing the land, somebody dies in the house, partition of land, it's now easily updatable. Disputes over last nine years have in fact come down to one third. And that's amazing, which showed that most of the time we ourselves in the public sector were responsible for these disputes to come. We were favoring people on extraneous grounds, we were tempering with the records and therefore disputes were coming. It's not that the citizens were interested in disputes, we were actually creating disputes. Banks and other public sector agencies have full access to these land records, so the crop loans etc. are very easily available and the crop loan becoming easily available obviously helps farmers to grow more. The corruption has come down drastically uh, on, on the World Bank website, you will find some studies about Bhumi. There have been large number of surveys including a bank survey and a Ford Foundation survey. National Lots of national surveys are also there which indicate that the corruption has come down huge. As far as distribution of land records is concerned, it has nearly reduced to zero. In updation, there is still some corruption but has come down drastically. What were the challenges faced while this project was implemented? Indifferent and cynical attitude of the bureaucracy. They were obviously not interested. They were indifferent. They were cynical. The fact that the data size was 1 billion obviously made people not very comfortable. They were not able to understand as to how such data can go into an electronic medium. And you are talking about the year 1999 when internet had just come. In fact, in this country, there was just one ISP called BSNL at that time. Uh, Windows 98 has just come, people were working on 95, security of data, server operating systems were not there. There were no 
I mean, there was lack of IT processes and IT understanding within the government, within the government. People did not know how to work on computers. This was one of the earliest projects which came in country, apart from the railway reservation which has happened in a state government. And therefore, it was perhaps right for them to be cynical, indifferent, because perhaps they did not gain anything. In fact, they were losing power on the other side, and one could therefore understand. Managing IT infrastructure at village level was a huge challenge at the time. It continues to be a challenge now. But imagine seven, eight years back, managing managing IT infrastructure at village level and a small level. How do you maintain the machines? How do you guarantee uptime? How do you ensure that the data entry and things like that, virus systems, operating systems upgrade, printers problem, how do you take care of those things? There was nothing called network at that time. There was no networks at that time. Wide area networks were not heard of. I mean, local area network operating systems were just emerging. So how could you, how do you take care of disaster recovery? How do you take backups? How do you ensure that your data is not lost? It was a huge challenge. And obviously there was nothing called data center at that time, 10 years back. And therefore, if you had to put the data on the web, you have to create a data center, create networks. So in the year 2003, we created a data center in Bangalore, created a VSAT-based network, satellite-based network, because the terrestrial lines were still weak in the country. Now they are quite strong. But five years back, satellite communication, VSAT-based system was the only way to connect remote locations. User charges of 15 rupees were opposed drastically. People were just not interested. Politicians were not interested. You just can't charge farmers. Farmers are although keen to pay, but the political masters, for various reasons, opposed and said, how you can charge 15 rupees? And the fact is that at that time, there was no concept of user charges in this country. Everything was free. And first time when this 15 rupees came, I remember that we had to struggle for two, three years. Every political government, every political uh, master, these political uh, representatives opposed this. And thanks to the price user charges which were put, the culture which has now come, almost every e-government public service now is priced in this country. And people are ready to pay. I mean, it has demonstrated amply that if you provide a better quality of service, people don't mind paying. And thanks to these type of innovative projects, the culture changed. Centralization of services were opposed drastically at that time. And we knew we were getting into a mess. You had 10,000 distribution points through those 10,000 village officials who were obviously corrupt who were manipulating the data, but the fact is, those who, who could pay them, the services were delivered at 10,000 points. It was all of a sudden reduced to 200 points. People had to travel, people had to come a long distance to get a land record copy, although it was secured, although it was easily available, people did not really like it. And I remember that we were, we were, we were told that, look, this is not a good thing to do. We could not understand as to how do we create those many distribution points by the government. We cannot sustain them. We cannot maintain them. And that was a challenge. On one side, you centralize data. On the other side, demand the citizens should get those records uh, decentralized manner. Errors in data entry. One billion data fields were to be digitized. And obviously, obviously, nobody could have said that there would not be errors. And there were errors thanks to cynical attitude, thanks to indifferent attitude, which got filtered in last seven, eight years. But the fact is, five to 10 percent errors uh, in, a, in a land record data digitization was a huge challenge at the time. Public sector continued indifference while citizens are keen. Even now, public sector is not very excited in doing this. They don't even now see any 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 excitement in managing this data. So they they perhaps the the discretion they had, the power to temper which they had has gone, and therefore indifference is still there. Uh, citizens are extremely keen. This is one project and similar projects which citizens will not allow you to roll back. There can be a huge chaos if you try to touch such land record systems in this country or for that matter any service which is popular. In spite of the fact that public sector politicians may or may not like, citizens will not allow you to roll back on these type of projects. Not fully updated records were used for digitization at the time. The records were not updated in many cases. Citizens were not keen to come to the government because they thought every time I, I go to the government, people would siphon money. People would suck money out of my, my, my neck. And therefore, a father died. Children were not interested in getting the name of the father removed. 
and, and hence the records in many cases had fathers and mothers name when they had died long back. Thanks to the updation mechanism which we put where requests can now be given online, they are accounted on a very simple internet principle of first in first out the way. I mean the government actually works on a stack principle, last in first out. But uh, we, uh, that's the way, you, you pay money and you have come last and you enter first and you get your work done first. But in Bhumi, we now have a principle of what is called first in, first out. If you request for a change to your land record called mutation, your change is accepted first. And that gave the confidence to the people that, look, if I come to these telecenters and make a request, my work will be done. And because there is FIFO principle, the first in, first out principle, if I don't even approach the village official, there's no way he can ignore my work because if there is somebody down the line who is ready to pay the bribe, if that man has to accept bribe for the seventh person, the first six people work will be automatically done. So there is a socialism in corruption in this country now. Other benefits, something, some spin effects which, which came because of this project. This became a nucleus for further e-governance grow, growth in this country. People understood, the governments understood that look, these projects are doable. It's not that such huge projects cannot be done in this country with the type of a bureaucracy which we have. And that, thanks to this type of projects done early 2000, people took up new projects in public sector. Telecenters became viable because of Bhumi services. The telecenters which came up in Karnataka became viable because this was an application which was so popular. It gave them that mass, that money to survive in the market. And thanks to these services, other 40 services have now come up in Karnataka like caste certificate, income certificate, death certificate, birth certificate, and plethora of them which all revolve around the land record system and have now made those electronic services available at the village level. And the biggest thing is that villagers' culture is changing. They now want better services. They understand. They challenge government that when these systems have been computerized, services have been put online, why should other services be not put online? And I think the villagers, the farmers now expecting more from the government is something which is very encouraging. And I'm sure in coming days we will provide more and more sec services in public sector using the tools of IT. The project has been replicated all over the country. That was about three, four years back. Uh, it, it, it got its share of praises from different places. It got the United Nations Public Service Award. It got the Commonwealth Innovation Award. And it also got Prime Minister's Award for Excellence. This is my ID in case anybody wants to know more. I can certainly provide the required information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chapler. I'll get it right this time. Um, are there any quick questions? Is there one quick question before we go on to the next presentation? Uh, yes, one question. Sir, uh, I'm a very uh, from the ego What are the uh, challenges in uh, uh, taking this all over the, in, in India? Thank you. Concept-wise, it was well understood, it's required everywhere. Uh, therefore, the federal government understood it needs to be replicated everywhere. The state governments understood it has to be replicated <coughs> everywhere. Efforts were made, money was pushed. However, it has, it has met with a mixed success. The problem is, again, the attitude of the bureaucracy. And the biggest challenge is that how do you digitize the day zero data? It's lying in books, it is in a very bad shape, it's not readable in many cases, it has been tempered in large number of cases. How do you pick up this one billion data field and put them onto a machine and digitize and validate? And then around that data, you, you put up processes for distribution of records and updation of records. Yes, it has met with little success, not little, moderate success. There are about three to four states out of 30 odd states which we have in this country where services of a Bhumi type are made available. And I'm sure that in coming seven to eight to 10 years, what has happened under Bhumi will, will perhaps happen everywhere. Mr. 
I mean, government of India, when they say 14 states, it's, it's very subjective in nature. When you talk about what has been put online, I mean, you know, it's, there's nothing called zero all the citizens. Thank you very much. I think we'll now move on to uh, Ilka Lakaniemi, um, who will now tell us a little bit about um, the, the experience um, from the point of view of, uh, of both a small country and from Nokia Siemens Networks. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think it was a fascinating story that we heard about Bumi, and uh, I think it shows that India not only being cradle for innovation in ICT services, but especially in e-governance type of services is clearly a place to look at and actually adapt some of those models to other countries as well. And that's something that we are currently doing here as, as Nokia Group as well. Uh, uh, very shortly about myself, um, uh, I work for currently for Nokia Siemens Networks, which is a new company that was set up in 2007 in April uh, as an infrastructure business from uh, Nokia Networks and Siemens Coms, and it became something which we called Nokia Siemens Networks of today. It is a part of it is a part of Nokia Group. Uh, and I work for the Nokia Group also as a corporate economist, so very much focusing on the issues that how do you get socioeconomic benefits out of the technologies that we employ and, and manufacture. But at the same time also, I have a specific interest on the public sector information that I uh, represent the Nokia Group in the Confederation of the Finnish Industries in a working group which is called uh, ICT and Productivity. And in that working group, what we're doing in Finland is that we are very much focusing on how we are better able to make the public sector itself more efficient, uh, to implement and utilize ICT in, 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 in a clearer fashion, but also at the same time coming out with different type of services that can be done with private-public partnership. Uh, and in the case of Finland, it is an imperative thing because Finland together with Italy and Japan will be hardest hit by the aging process uh, that will is a result in, in, in a way that for instance in Finland we have to be better able to utilize the public sector information to maintain our competitive advantage as an economy. So those are the type of issues that we are dealing with and in Finland. And what I will be discussing today is primarily the experience that we have had. As we saw from the EU presentation, this has been on for quite a long time already. And it's nothing new that you should engage uh, the public sector information to get that digitized, to get that in an online format, and to utilize that for uh, productive utilization, whether in case of commercial usage or, or otherwise. Uh, when I started at Nokia in 2000, I joined a group called Nokia Ventures. And one of the issues that we did in there was to assess which are the new growth potentials uh, for ICT and how to utilize the ICT, especially in those areas. Uh, we looked into the healthcare sector, how to make that more efficient with ICT. We looked into the, uh, the public sector information, as we're speaking today, in kind of a lump itself and how that lump of information can be utilized for two different purposes. As I said, whether the reuse for commercial purposes or how it can be more efficiently utilized for our advantage, whether we talk about the Finnish economy or Finnish industries at that time. Uh, so in 1998, as we saw from the EU presentation, the European Union already recognized that uh, public sector information is a key European resource for European competitiveness. And through that work, we were actually looking into how, in the case of Finland, we would be able to have an ecosystem that has an easier access, that has a greater utilization of public sector information, and that can be benefiting not only to the large corporations, but especially, and I think in case of India, especially also for SMEs, so small and medium-sized enterprises, how they are able to reutilize the information. 
whether it's weather information or, or registry information or statistics. In our case, statistics is by far one of those areas that we look more closely into. So after the initial stages within the Finnish industry in looking into or assessing the opportunity, uh, the experience so far has been that when reflecting to those 13 or perhaps coming 14 or 15 recommendation points that the OECD is coming out with, uh, the greatest challenges that are being faced still now in Finland have to do with the, the openness. Uh, they have to do with the access and transparency of the information. And what that basically means is that there is a lack of a, as we heard, a central body within Finland that would actually guarantee that you have a list of all the different information that there is that can be utilized. Uh, you don't have a credible authority uh, in Finland that currently maintains that database and is able to cooperate with the, uh, the private sector as such to maintain a kind of a easy cooperation. Because one of the, uh, the reasons, for instance, when in 2000 I said within the Nokia Ventures, when we looked into the public sector information, we clearly very fastly noticed that in order to that public sector information, I need to go to all the different provinces of Finland and discuss with all the local authorities about utilization of their information. There was no centralized body of uh, which to negotiate of utilizing uh, the information. And that continues to be one of the key challenges. Whether that body is called a regulator or, or something else, then, then we can discuss on that. But the legal changes, as you referred in the case of the European Union, they have been made. So the legal framework is in place. Uh, people know that there is a directive, there is a law that needs to be obeyed, uh, there is a law that uh, needs to be followed, and, and the recommendations from the OECD are, are now being uh, made as well. Uh, but that clear lack of responsibility, centralized responsibility, plus uh, the, uh, the lack of understanding what type of information there is uh, are the, uh, the key challenges of hindering that development. In the history of Finland, we heard about the case of India. In the history of Finland, for instance, the land registry in Finland was done by the church. And that was rather a credible institution and also a centralized institution. So uh, currently the church is not doing that activity anymore, but um, maybe, maybe it should. Uh, in, in, in a case of uh, our recent activities, then based on the experience that stems for about 10 years now, uh, we, we came back to the public sector information actually in the beginning of this year. Uh, Nokia CMS Networks, we commissioned an economic study on uh, the utilization of ICT and how do you get the most economic benefits of different type of ICT, whether it's the infrastructure, whether it's different devices, whether it's uh, all different type of services, including e-governance type of services. And during that analysis, uh, it became clear that out of the 16 OECD economies or the innovation driven economies that we assessed, Finland placed number six out of those 16. And we were way behind the other Nordic countries like uh, Sweden or Denmark or, or, or Norway in that, this respect. So what we did in Finland was that uh, through the confederation of the Finnish industries, we uh, made our recommendations uh, and we delivered that message to the Finnish ministries and, and the, uh, the Finnish government, which is responsible for, for the public sector information and distribution of that. Uh, and, um, and we're still waiting for, I guess, for response. <laughs> but, but basically, the, the private sector has said that in order to truly utilize the public sector information, uh, we do see that there is a market opportunity for that. And we don't have to look far where that market opportunity has been seized properly, and that's the United States. And United States shows an example for the European Union directive as well, how to best, in the current practices, to utilize the public sector information. 
And in terms of market op opportunity assessment, for instance, in 2006, the potential market for the utilization of public sector information was considered to be somewhere between 10 to 40 billion euros, uh, of which only the map information uh, was regarded to be 1.5 billion market opportunity. So there is a clear commercial business type of a case here that we are really uh, seeing, but uh, currently what there is lacking is the concentrated effort between the private and the public sector to, to move forward. It requires, I guess, like in the case of IGF, a multi-stakeholder group and discussion as we are having here at the, uh, on, the, uh, on the issue of internet governance as well. Then, uh, furthermore, on the Finnish uh, experience and, the, and the, not only the challenges but also for the opportunities, and we can discuss this during the panel discussion as well, uh, besides seeing the market potential, besides advocating for a centralized authority and for clear practices of doing that, uh, there are other issues that I'm glad that, for instance, Chris touched, and it's the pricing issue. Uh, pricing or charging for the type of services and what is going to be done with the public funding and what is going to be done with uh, public-private funding is, is one of the key issues that needs to be solved and, and, and looked into. Uh, the access to information in Finland is currently being uh, seen as something that already exists. There is not much to be improved in the access side, but on the other side, uh, the, we do see that there is not enough equality on that access. The small and medium